But during this time, all is not well with the country as a whole. At Mount Vernon, George Washington is receiving a series of letters from friends and former military men. Alexander Hamilton writes from Congress that without an army or a navy, America is completely powerless to deal with international problems. England should have long ago returned our lands in the West. Spain blocks our ships from the Mississippi. How do we defend our rights as a country? Do we have troops, a national treasury, or even a national government? We have a shadow of a federal government where 13 petty republics must agree on every point of every measure the Union wants to execute. The result? Nothing happens. The states have brought the wheels of national government to a standstill. You really see Hamilton tearing his hair and mumbling dirty whack of frass as, as the revolution ends because the Confederation government to him is absolutely nothing that's going to build the America he wants it to be. He has no patience whatsoever with this loose agreement. He sees very clearly that the states are going to go back to squabbling with each other. He wants a uniform currency. He wants uniform internal trade within the country. And when he sees Rhode Island charging Massachusetts a tariff every time someone brings eggs from one state to the other, he's absolutely disgusted. Sometimes I think I'm wasting my time in public service. I hate Congress. I hate the world. A mass of fools and knaves. I hate myself. Border disputes smolder between the states. Pennsylvania is fighting with Connecticut over which state will control land to the west. It is clear that these might become full-fledged shooting wars. Observers in England smugly declare that all this is inevitable. The popular opinion certainly believed that uh, the American experiment couldn't possibly survive. Uh, it was uh, remarkably um, liberal. The government was very weak. Uh, the country was very extensive. Uh, and there was really no possibility uh, of this absurdly new, fresh government uh, surviving more than a few years. It would disintegrate. One underlying crisis overshadows everything else. The United States was bankrupt. Uh, that's easy to say. It had no ability to tax. It, it, all it could do was request the states to give it money. The financial situation was very, very serious with huge war debts that had to be paid if you're going to restore the credit of the country. The states are slipping into an economic depression. Americans are dividing into two camps, creditors and debtors. We are oppressed by the very men whose property we fought for, whose independence we bled for. Yes, we owe money to these men, whose purses are their conscience, who hear their lust for wealth louder than the cries of the poor and the needy. In 1786 in Massachusetts, the antagonism between the debtors and creditors breaks out into open conflict. Angry farmers arm themselves and march on the state courthouse in Springfield. The local militia join with the farmers. Daniel Shays, the leader of the insurgents, becomes a folk hero. Soon, debtor rebellions are breaking out in all 13 states. The debtors are by far the majority. The popularly elected legislatures pass laws which, in effect, cancel all debts, trampling on the property rights of the creditors. I was as strong a believer in popular government as any man in America. But it is rapidly becoming the last kind of government I should choose. I'd even prefer a limited monarchy at this time. Better the whims of one man than the ignorance and passions of the mob. Shea's rebellion shakes people's belief in popular government. There is now a rumor circulating through the states that Nathaniel Gorham, president of the Continental Congress, has approached Prince Henry of Prussia. 
Our free institutions of government have failed, he is quoted as saying. Will you please come to America and be our king? Prince Henry is said to have reminded Gorham that Americans did not get along very well with their last king and to have curtly declined the offer.